Uh, hi, I'm Madonna. I'm your worst nightmare. To rule the world. Why don't you show them what you do, honey? You've never had more fun with anyone else. People, people, we've got to move on to the next song. Somewhere I'm sweet between. and I'm a bitch, you know what I mean? And that's always been the way it is. I'm, I'm a human being. <laughs> I'm waiting. Hi, this is Chavez, and you're listening to MLBC Podcast. Hey, guys, it's Tony, and I can't believe Ingrid Chavez is here. <laughs> Hi. Hey, everybody, this is Stefan. Thanks for joining us for another episode of MLVC, the Madonna Podcast, your place for all things Madonna Louise Veronica Ciccone. Today's very special guest is someone who we've been wanting, needing, <laughs> waiting for on the show. We are joined by poet, songwriter, singer, and artist Ingrid Chavez. Ingrid, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Wow, Ingrid, this is really great. Um, so before we get down to some questions, I'm going to give you a proper introduction for our audience. Um, Stefan, will you please do the honors? Uh, yes, of course. So Ingrid Chavez was raised in Marietta, Georgia, and relocated to Minneapolis in 1986, which led to a very chance encounter with none other than Prince. The result of that encounter was Ingrid's first album titled May 19, 1992, released on the Paisley Park Records label. Ingrid also appeared in Prince's, on Prince's Love Sexy album as The Spirit Child and starred opposite Prince in the feature film Graffiti Bridge as Aura and Angel. And it was during an overdub session for Graffiti Bridge that Ingrid happened into a room with Lenny Kravitz and Andre Betts where the iconic song Justify My Love was created and which went on to become a number one hit for, of course, Madonna in 1991 along with releasing multiple solo releases and collaborations in the past two decades. She's a mother, a mentor for female artists on the rise, an entrepreneur with her Snow and Ink collection. And on December 18th, she will officially release her very own recording of Justify My Love via her 10 Windows record label imprint. So that's just a, just a hint of some of her <laughs> accomplishments throughout the years. But, um, and we will get to Justify My Love very, very soon. But um, first, how, Ingrid, how is your pandemic treating you? Well, um, I live in heaven. So um, I think that even if there wasn't a <laughs> pandemic, I would be home all the time just creating stuff anyway. So it hasn't made a huge difference in my life. So, but it's going well. It looks very beautiful where you're at. Lots of nature. Yeah, I live in a redwood forest. So Oh, nice. oh, wow. That's got to be like great inspiration for your work, right? It is. It was, um, I mean, I was in New Hampshire before and snow was always the inspiration for me. And it was a theme that, you know, went through all of my work, writing and music. Mm -hmm. And now I'm here and it has taken a minute to try to settle in and um, figure out like, what is my relationship to this new environment? So it's, it's coming. It's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So I'm just going to jump right into Prince and Minneapolis. So I, Minneapolis in the late 80s was insane. I mean, just I was growing up in Texas and I could tell that there was something going on over there with, you know, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis and Janet Jackson and Prince and the revolution. And, and then you ended up in Minneapolis. Tell us what it was like there um, when you got there, what the music scene and the art scene was like. Yeah, well, I moved um, from Atlanta and I was 20 and I was going to my first bar experiences was like weekends. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of weekends in Atlanta, but back in the early 80s, that was the place mm -hmm. to be. And so then I moved to Minneapolis and I wasn't able to go into the bars yet because their drinking age was 21. So I had to wait a little while. But right. then when I did finally <laughs> get to go, um, First Avenue was just the place to be, you know, um, Glam Slam wasn't open yet. So First Avenue mm -hmm. was the place where you would go dancing and um, you would um, see everybody there. So when I first moved there, that was where I went. And I wound up meeting some girls and crew creating my little crew. And we'd go out and um, then we'd go to Williams Pub, which was the other place back then that was hopping on a Tuesday night. And that's where I wound up meeting Prince. Um, 
uh, but yeah, it was um, the music scene back then. Then was was just like the scene with the time and all that. You didn't see the time hanging out. You didn't see Prince. You'd see Prince hanging out sometimes. But you know what I do remember back then was all the musicians who hadn't yet made it into like Maserati and all these other bands that came up during that period that I knew these mm-hmm. guys when they weren't in bands yet, but they were musicians and they carried around their guitars and, you know, stuff like that. And that's a part of Minneapolis that right. I feel really honored to get to be a part of. Um, you know, Michael Bland, mm-hmm. you know, I run into him and he's just still say like, I remember you, I, you'd be taking the bus and um, you'd always have a notebook and you're always like writing or doing something. And you were just always like, you know, this like mysterious figure in Minneapolis and you know (laughs) we all wound up doing something you know really cool in the city as the years went on and we you know kept you know just putting it out there that we're musicians and and you know like working with people here you know years later we're all like in these either have records or on other people's records and you know it's it's an awesome scene and Minneapolis has always been famous for dumping tons of money into the art scene so yeah, I, I w- in doing all this research, I had read that, and you know, Prince had a lot to do with it too. In the you know the late '80s, um, you know, he you know became very philanthropic, and not a lot of people know about that. I know that he helped a lot of children's uh, charities, and you know, um, also helped with you know music education in schools. But you know, people don't like to talk about that. They'd rather <laughs> talk about other stuff. But um. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, did you love sexy is not available to stream and I'm very upset about that. Um, I remember buying love sexy and my parents were very upset because they didn't like the cover, but that's okay. I played it anyway. <laughs> and I heard your voice and how did, how did, how did you guys decide to kind of make you the, the muse of the album? Because the spirit child is, you know, you know, you hear your voice in the beginning, but this theme recurs through the whole record, right? Yeah. Well, I met Prince at Williams and um, it was, there was something he was going through that night, which, you know, there's been a lot of stories about that night, but all my, all I knew about that night was that um, we met and he asked me to go to Paisley Park with him that night. And Paisley Park was really new. So um, I got in the Mm -hmm. car and, you know, it changed the trajectory of my life that night. And whatever was going on with Prince, he decided that night to um, not release the Black Album. And that is the night that he made the decision to start a new project, which was Love Sexy. So that whole record um, was born out of whatever spiritual experience he was having that night, whatever epiphany, whatever Mm -hmm. was going on in his creative, you know, mind that night started that night. And um, so the record and the the concept of the spirit child was just an organic, you know, um, response to us spending time and hanging out and talking in our conversations and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah um you know it was just a natural always looked um, looked very serious yeah he he wasn't serious all the time he was very funny very um playful so you know i know that in pictures you rarely see that side of him but in person he's really really funny Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, you, you could tell by, you know, some of the turn of phrase that he throws into his lyrics, his lyrics. And, you know, I've seen him live a few times and he he's so charming. He was so charming and engaging with his audience. Like, you know, he really appreciated them being there. Um, so I want to ask about your your poetry. So um, when you were working with Prince, you know, with Love Sex, you know, that and did you show him your poetry or did you guys work on it together? I mean, I, I kind of feel like you already had, you know, something to bring to the table, right? Well, shortly after I met him, he, you know, he threw out that challenge of like, Oh, if you're a musician, I'm going to put you in studio B and let's see what you got. So, um, 
he, oh, wow. I went into the studio <laughs> and um, I just went in with just me. Like I didn't, I had a guitar, but I don't play mm-hmm. guitar, but I just, I was like, I can do something. I'll make something happen. But what happened was cross the line. Mm-hmm. The poem that was in the um, intermission of um, Left Sexy. So, um, yeah. So that was probably about a, a week or two after I met him that I recorded that piece. Mm-hmm. And after that, he asked me if, if I would like to complete, would like to make a whole record like that. So um, mm-hmm. he said, um, write 21 poems and um, we'll go into the studio. So I, I got to work, you know, <laughs> writing my little poems. Yeah. And um, we did. We we went into the studio. And um, I can see that the internet connection is funky right now. But um, so, yeah, we went into the studio. And um, so it, it was that kind of creative back and forth. Like I was writing poems to speak to him like cross the line was me speaking Mm -hmm. to him and that's the way that I my letters um a lot of my letters especially back then not so much now but back then my letter to you would be a poem you know so um cross the line was kind of a a letter to him and he he um just thought it was just fascinating that just that way of communicating with people. And so it was his idea to go in and make the poetry album based on his experience with me. That, Yeah. No, that's amazing because I I love that type of communication. I hadn't really heard spoken word, you know, in the late eighties until your album, May 19th, 1992, because it just wasn't popular, you know? I mean, at the time rap was coming up and beat poetry, you know, flowetry, that kind of thing was coming out. But then all of a sudden you hear this ethereal voice um, just reciting just beautiful words and concepts. And to me, that was like, that's all I needed, you know? So did you encounter any pushback from Warner Brothers or any of your collaborators? Because this was a new concept. And even though Prince had your back, you know, this this wasn't anything that, a lot of people were expecting from him or from his collaborators. They just, you know, it it almost had to be explained to them. Right. Yeah. But I think, um, Prince's love and appreciation for the project and his direct involvement is sold Mm that everybody was like, yes, Mm -hmm. because he didn't just like piecemeal it and say like, Oh, um, what do you think about this Warner Brothers? Do you want to get into this? You know, we made the record and he just said, this is it. This is what's happening. And everybody just loved it. You know, everybody Mm -hmm. loved it. And it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a hard sell. It was like, this is something um, really unique. And it was just so pretty. The whole record was so pretty that, you know, no one ever pushed back on it. Oh, that's great to hear. I, I, remember going to buy the Hippie Blood 12 inch because um, I had to have it. And you looked so beautiful on the cover. You had this very androgynous look and you were wearing men's clothing. And that was like my first introduction to your album. And I love all of the subsequent singles and the art direction for the entire project was just incredible. Like how much or how, or how little did you have to do with that? Um, well, so the um, the hippie blood cover was when Prince was like, we're going to we want to shoot a cover for it. I just want you to go in as yourself. Just go in with mm-hmm. how you dress. Just do you. And, you know, I was like this, you know, I didn't have, have any money. I was just like this single mom living in the city. And all my clothes were like secondhand. And if it, something was new, it was like, mm-hmm. you know, woo! It's like the new, new shoes. It wasn't bought at the secondhand store. <laughs> but, you know, he was like, you know, he was just really dug who I was as a person. And so that cover was just him saying, go in and do you. The rest of the album, um, when it came to um, the artwork for the rest of the album, was um, I worked with, um, I can't remember her name, Debbie, somebody who um, she she was doing the art the artwork and everything were helping to, you know, bring together the album. Mm -hmm. And um, when I spoke to her, the concept 
of that and um, the Elephant Box video is that I'm a really big um, Man Ray fan. He's a photographer. Oh, um, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, so um, mm-hmm. the, the, the concept... That, that explains that, why that Elephant Box video is so beautiful. Yeah, it was, it was all like, let's bring in the elements of um, Man Ray's photography. So that's why you see the lips and... You know, it's it's like mm. 1920s and 30s, you know, that style. And um, so that was a concept of that. So when we when we went into the album, we carried that through the album. And I was like, I really wanted to be um, this sort of 1920s Paris vibe. Um, and so that's what, you know, yeah. I wanted to be like these deeply dark brown tones. And yeah, so I had a lot to do with that. But um, the woman, Debbie, really followed through and helped me to, to realize that vision for the album. That, it's so great to hear you say that because I remember when I first heard your album, uh, I I had just been reading some Anais Nin and I was like, this takes me to that place that I want to be in, you know what I mean? But it's modern and it's Ingrid, you know, so <laughs> that it's like full circle. Uh, that, that, that the visual of the videos and the artwork and everything was just so different from anything that had ever been released on Paisley Park because... I think mainly mm-hmm. as Prince wasn't so involved with it, you know, and I, and Prince never looked at me as like this sexy being. He looked at me as like, um, of a, as a poet, as, you know, this unique yeah. um, spiritual being that, um, he trusted that I, that I should represent myself the way that I did. So. Yeah, that's very, that's very evident because, you know, Prince has famously worked with some, you know, as people, have been calling them his muses or, um, you know, he'll get fixated on, you know, a female singer, but this is what, what, what he did with you was very different. Uh, you guys were more collaborators and there was like a different connection than for example, when he worked with vanity, you know what I mean? It just, it just rings true. You know what I mean? True. Yeah. And I thought, um, so I had watched your elephant box video, which, I, I had to Google what an elephant box was. I, I, I was like, I, <laughs> I, I didn't box. quite know what an elephant, I know. I was like, what, what is she talking about? Um, but um, I learned that uh, elephant box was remixed by Junior Vasquez, which it was a, an amazing house remix. I loved it. And I was just curious if like at that time, I mean, I know you were a mom, but did you ever like go out to a nightclub and just be like, looking for inspiration for possible music or is that not how you would write musically? Yeah, that's not how I, that's not how I worked. I mean, my, my, um, my writing process is always such a, an inside intimate experience. And it's always like in this like environment where I bring the music into my environment and work from that space. And so um, that's Mm -hmm. why there's, that's why it is the way it is. It's because it's such a personal, intimate um, experience for me. Yeah. It's like having you whisper in our ears, which is not a bad thing. <laughs> so before your album came out, you participated in the unofficial sequel to one of my favorite films, Purple Rain. And that was Prince's Graffiti Bridge, which he also wrote and directed. Uh, also, you co-starred with The Time as Aura the ethereal angel-like figure. Uh, tell us how that came about and were you nervous to, uh, to make a film debut in Prince's film? Well, that, that came... So Heaven Must Be Near was already filmed and Prince had um, mm-hmm. directed and came up with a concept for that. Heaven Must Be Near for him was like mm-hmm. just the most beautiful thing that had ever been ever recorded. And so he wanted this video. And so Craig Rice, who produced Purple Rain and Graffiti Bridge, produced that Mm -hmm. video. And um, so when, so that video was already made and it was just so beautiful to look at. Yeah. When the other, Mm -hmm. the other actors that Prince had originally thought he would work with for, um, Graffiti Bridge wound up not being a part of the film. Craig asked him, well, you know, Ingrid is Aura. She is that character, you know, and um, why don't you ask her to, you know, screen test for it? 
And um, so we did the screen test for it. And, you know, they gave me the part. It was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. I mean, really, it was. But I've never said no. Like when Prince first said, I'm going to put you in Studio B. Let's see what you got. And I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And when he said, we're going to shoot a video called Heaven Must Be Near. Get out there in that field and give us what you got. (laughs) I said, yes. (laughs) Um, And when they said, um, play, we want you to play the part of Aura. That was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life because I've never, never done any acting and it shows, I mean, I'm not an actress and you know, so it was scary. Yeah. But playing Aura was more about a a feeling, you know, Um, Aura, whenever she was in a scene, you she didn't even have to say anything. She was just there, you know, sometimes almost just like floating, you know, even, you know, not physically, but that, that, that's what I loved about that character. It almost reminds me of, um, there was a movie called All That Jazz and Jessica Lange plays an angel and she just kind of walks in, walks out, you know, and it's, that was, that remind, your performance reminded me of that because it's, it's very understated, but everyone knows you're in the frame. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And you look great on the poster as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, that's all that matters. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, exactly. At, at the end of the day. Um, so turning a little bit to uh, justify my love. So you're responsible for one of Madonna's most iconic songs. I think that was a, a turning point in her career when that song came out up until Justify My Love, Madonna was very much like standard pop songs. I mean, great pop songs, but very like by the book, radio friendly. And I remember uh, in Philadelphia when Justify My Love premiered on the radio, Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what I was listening to. You know, they said it was Madonna and I didn't believe it because it just sounded so off of what anything she had ever done. And I know there's been a lot of like, speculation into how the song got to Madonna. A lot of Madonna fans might not know the full story about Justify My Love. So tell us how, first of all, like you went into writing Justify My Love. Where did that inspiration come from? So let's set the story straight then. Um, I was in um, Los Angeles, like you um, mentioned before, just doing some pickup shots for Graffiti Bridge and, you know, doing some overdubs and, um, Lenny, who I'd already met before, was in the studio and um, him and Andre were going to just create something. So they invited me to come in and I was pretty much just hanging out, coloring with Zoe. She was just a little girl back then. And um, <laughs> and she was like this big, gorgeous star now. But she was just a little girl with coloring crayons and uh, coloring book. But um they were just working on this beat and it it just sounded fantastic. I mean, you know, the, the way a song like that goes, you know, you get a beat and you're like, you loop it and you're like, Oh yeah, that sounds good. Let's put some strings in there. Oh, that's sounding good. And there's like, Hey Ingrid, um, you got anything? And I had this letter, this poem on me that was a poem letter. And um, I said, yeah. And I literally went in and recorded exactly how it sounds now, just like it is. There was no editing, Mm -hmm. no, you know, going back and moving things around. It was like, that was the, I think that, um, I think what was unique about my, um, my delivery when it comes to poetry over music was that it was like this Mm -hmm. internal flow that just kind of moved over the top of music, Mm -hmm. you know, whereas, you know, Mm -hmm. a lot of stuff at the time was like in time with the beat and it was like trying to like create this like you know juxtaposition with the beat where mine was just like floating over the top of (laughs) the beat and um and that was exactly what we wound up with um we recorded the vocals um me singing the um the chorus and then that was it we mixed Mm -hmm. it down and about the next day, I think the next day, um, I went with Lenny over to um, Virgin Records, and um, my record wasn't out yet. 
And, um, and it wasn't even finished yet, but, um, I went over to, um, to Virgin with, with Lenny and we let the head of Virgin listen to it. And I can't remember his name now. And, um, he, he said, Oh, that's really cool. Um, can I have a copy of it? And I was like, yeah, this is my only copy. And Lenny was like, I'll get you another copy. And I was like, okay. And, um, that never happened. I never got another copy. And, um, mm. next thing I know, so Lenny met up with me in New York and he, um, it was like a different Lenny. It wasn't the Lenny that I wrote the song with. And it wasn't the Lenny that, um, you know, I hung out with in the past with, you know, he was, he was, um, saying that, um, if I didn't sign off on being, um, a, like a ghost writer, that, um, that I wouldn't get anything, any, any money for it. I wouldn't, mm. they would just like, take me to court and I would, I would lose all rights and everything to this, to the song. And because even though it wasn't the Lenny that I knew, I still considered Lenny as a friend and somebody who I felt like I, I should, I should be able to trust. And I knew that it wasn't right, but at the same time, I just felt like, I don't, I don't understand what's going on here, but anyway, I signed off on this. And um, next thing I know, the song is on the radio. I'm like, Oh, okay. It sounded exactly like the original recording, like same placement of every word, even, even the background vocals. I was like, is that me? Or is she singing just mm -hmm. like me? Mm -hmm. I can't even tell anymore, you know, but what happened immediately after it was now, when I signed that, um, that, that, um, that contract, it said, you cannot tell anyone. So I never told anyone. No one knew about that song. No one knew that I wrote it, not even Prince. And my record hadn't come out yet. So Prince calls me up and he says, Ingrid, what's up with that Madonna song? That's you. I know it's you. I know it's you. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time that I ever admitted to anyone that, yes, I did. I, I um, recorded that with Lenny and um, it's me. And he said, are you stupid? People are going to think that you are copying Madonna now. You haven't released your record yet. Mm. People are going to think you're copying her. So that is when I, um, I said, okay, you're right. And I hired lawyers and um, it got nasty. It was like back in the MTV days when it was like, Lenny's released mm -hmm. a statement calling Ingrid, you know, whatever. And Ingrid has released a statement, you know, it was like the Kurt Loader days, you know, and um, it, yeah. was, <laughs> it was painful for me because that was so not who I was, you know? Um, right. And it really hurt that, um, that it had gone there, you know, like, why did Lenny do that to me? You know, um, we went to court and we settled, we didn't ever go to court, we settled out of court. And I'd never really got as much as I really deserved for that song, but I definitely got more than I was getting. And I got the credit. Mm -hmm. So that was the most important thing. You got the credit. Yeah. But, you know, I got the credit. Yeah. And so, you know, it was, it was like a hurtful time. And actually after that, I, I was on um, a promotional tour in Europe and um, I was promoting. Um, I'd already been, it, I'd already been recognized by then for having written justify my love. And so it was out there. So I was doing a promotional mm -hmm. tour for graffiti bridge and my record and justify my love. It was all kind of coming together now. And that was when I yeah. um, was, talking to um, a journalist um, a, from Germany who asked me who who I most would want to work with in, in, in the future. And it was David Sylvian. David Sylvian, uh, he mm -hmm. connected me with David. But um, after, after that experience with the movie and Just Find Love and all that stuff, I really just didn't want to. I didn't, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to have anything to do with the music business. And so that's, uh Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's when I, um, we're here. We're here. I, yeah, no, something came up and blacked out the screen. 
I um I made a conscious decision that I just I just I'm gonna marry David and we're gonna start a family and I'm just gonna like focus on that. And I literally turned my back on music for like 13 years. Wow. What a story, Ingrid. I I had never liked what Lenny did or what he said. I mean, even to this day, I mean, just recently I heard in an interview, he said, yeah, the song came to me. And I'm like, come yes, on, man. That is but I'll BS. leave that to the side, you know? That total BS. Yeah, I know. And, and, I, I, and I knew it from the beginning too, because as, you know, when Justify My Love came out, I was already familiar with your work. So it was like, you know, and people, you know, there was a lot of speculation, but um, I'm glad that this has been resolved, you know, because this is your legacy. And, you know, whenever anyone hears that song and they look to see who wrote it, your name is there, you know? Um, yeah. And that that's and it, super it important. It did, it did so it, change it, the um, direction that Madonna went. It totally changed her direction. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's, yeah. it's yeah. not just a song that like, oh, um, you know, you can run into someone. Oh, I, I wrote Like a Virgin. You know, that was a great song and everything. And that was like, that's one of her biggest songs. But I'm just saying maybe a smaller song. But that song actually shifted yeah. everything for her. And so to know that, at least now that people know that it was not written for her. It was not written for anyone but, but mm-hmm. me. And that it yeah. was presented to her that this will this will do exactly what you want to do. It will give you a new image. So, and it did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, it did because Justify My Love and also I, I would venture to say a lot of your spoken word recordings definitely informed the Erotica album. But um, let's go back to you, though. So it's been 30 years since the song was released and now you've reclaimed it and recorded your very own version, which is beautiful. I love the piano in it. So how did you... How how did this journey start? You know, I mean, you're working on new music, and and then how how did you decide to go back to justify my love? Well, I think that um, I mean, if you look at the the span of my life and my career, you if, if you go to any of my social media, you you rarely ever see anything that is looking back because I don't. I'm always mm-hmm. in the moment of my life. I'm always right here. And in yeah. those 13 years that I didn't um, work on music, anyone who knew me didn't even know what I'd ever done because it wasn't something mm-hmm. I ever spoke about. So um, it was never like a thought of mine, like I'm going to go back and re-record a version of that song myself. What happened was um, a couple of years ago, I was in Copenhagen and I was going to do a live performance with uh, Deep Dive Corporation and Mashti and uh, the Mashti Project. Mm -hmm. And um, they were like, would you be willing to do a live version of Justify My Love? And I was like, I have some dog snoring back here. I have another one back here. Yeah, I know. It's cute. (laughs) I like it. (laughs) Um, And I I was like, I don't know. Like, what 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 will it what will the music sound like? Like, how do we do this? And they, um, they just started playing a version, the version that you hear. And, um, I was like, okay, all right, I'll, I'll do it. And so, um, we performed it and that version is on YouTube. The first time I've ever performed it live is on YouTube. And, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, it was amazing to like, perform it and get such a great response from it because you know you you put stuff out into the world and you you let it go when you're an artist you just kind of put it out there and you move on to the next Mm -hmm. thing you know and um so you you don't always know what it means to someone else and Mm -hmm. when I performed it live it got such an amazing response that I decided, oh, you know, we decided that we should, we should record it, make a recording of it and and release it. And that was a couple of years ago. So it's been something that, you know, I put out memories of flying and then just by my love got put on the back burner. And it's just, so finally it's, it's all come, it's all coming together, but it was not something I ever thought I would do, but it happened because, um, of, of just doing a, a live performance of it and there is a remix package which 
wait till you guys hear some of those remixes. Oof, they are hot. Oh, damn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I love me some, some remixes. I know. I love remixes. And, and I love also that you sort of, by releasing your own version of Justify My Love, you're sort of taking it back. You're sort of like claiming that song and sort of moving past the bad situation that originally happened and saying, mm -hmm. you know what? That was in the past. I'm okay. It's, uh, it is what it is. And ultimately, this is my song and I can sing it if I want to. <laughs> yeah, and setting the record straight because there's been, especially amongst Madonna fans, there's been so much speculation because no one's ever told the real story. They've always had no comment or they told the wrong story. So I, I appreciate you telling us what really happened. And this is, this is the facts. Yeah. You know? And I don't. Yeah. And very appropriate I, I also see, that it's coming out. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was going to say it's, it's very appropriate that it's coming out, you know, the Immaculate Collection, which was where Justify My Love first came out, um, just celebrated 30 years. So it's sort of, it's very appropriate that like, not that you're commemorating the anniversary of yeah. that, but that it's, it's, it's very well-timed. Yeah. Well, like I said, you know, um, like we recorded this a few years ago, so, and it was meant to be released a few years ago. Things just got in the way, you know, like things, other things mm -hmm. just came up. So yeah, great timing. <laughs> yep, absolutely. So Tell us about your recent musical collaborations and, and you know, I've, I've noticed that there's this big spiritual component to your work. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I think um, just um, honesty and being in the moment of my life and speaking from, um, I'm not a storyteller. Like I don't just like make up stories, like everything that you'll ever um, hear of mine that lyrically or, you know, like, uh, yeah, lyrically will always be from the moment in my life right now that I'm, I'm, I'm sharing. And so it's that intimacy with my, with myself and my own writing and writing in the, in the mm -hmm. life that I live that, comes off as spiritual, but it is just about being in the moment of your life. Wow. So it's, so, so that's really interesting because you're not telling us in your lyrics and in your words, you're not telling us about something that happened last year or 10 years ago. You're telling us about your immediate feeling at that moment. That's very powerful. Yeah, it is. And I think when you even think about like Just For My Love, what is so powerful about that song is that I pulled a letter out of my pocket that was going to someone. Mm -hmm. So it's very like powerful and strong emotionally for me to actually having not having not given that that letter out yet to actually like, oh, I can mm -hmm. like speak it into a microphone. And and that person will hear <laughs> it in in that in that way, that more powerful way. So um and I think that that's that's the running theme through all of my music. I'm always speaking to someone. I'm always talking mm -hmm. to someone, you know. It's almost as if you're channeling something from somewhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from my heart. Well, I, I, let me tell you, if, if, if that was a letter that you were, if Justify My Love was a letter that you were about to mail to somebody, I would love to have gotten a letter like that in the mail. <laughs> like, uh, that, like, that is one sexy, sexy song with some really, like, I, I, I've always said, I'm like, I want to do all of the activities that you mentioned in the song. <laughs> um, you know, like, make love on a train, cross country, and kiss in Paris, and hold my hands in Rome. Like, I've always wanted to do that. I just, uh, you know, Isn't that haven't been able to quite do the travel just yet. <laughs> After the pandemic, but Ingrid, you do you go and do Justify yeah. My Love? <laughs> yes. <laughs> World tour. <laughs> so, you also are um, a bit of an entrepreneur with uh, Snow and Ink, which is some really amazing items. I think I saw some incense, and there's some like some very like energy spiritual packages that you make available. So, so tell us about how that came to be and where people can find that and why that's important. Well, 
the concept of Snow and Ink came from um, me living in New Hampshire. So it was born in New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. This, and so it was from a poem, but the poem was um, written during just a little small short poem, but it was written during the a flutter in some words when I was in that period of writing. And the person who did the artwork mm-hmm. did the artwork all in, all in ink. So it was just like he was he, his primary form of um, painting and drawing was with just ink. So that was a collaboration between him and I, as far as him doing the artwork and all that. So living in New Hampshire with the snow and ink, which is black and white, just that contrast, but mm-hmm. also it sort of signifies the writer's life as well. So um, here I am in, in um, New Hampshire, I mean, in um, California in Big Sur, and that is what I've been doing during the pandemic. <laughs> Pouring candles and rolling. Time well spent. <laughs> <laughs> Learning to pour candles and rolling incense. And the incense that I make are from pure resins and like ground wood, like from scratch, like scratch, scratch. And um, the candles that I pour are luxury candles. They're made with coconut cream and, um, you know, like, the, the best quality um, fragrance oils that I can find. And they've got little gemstones. And, I mean, everything is handmade and um, really beautifully presented. So um, okay. during this pandemic period, of course, I've spent a lot of time alone. Who hasn't? And um, I've mm-hmm. each morning I would wake up and part of my routine was, you know, burning some Palo Santo and burning some sage and, and lighting the candles and, um, and like setting the intention for the day. And <clears throat> just at, at one point I was like, I should put together one of these little kits that I've been working on. And so that's what I did. I have, and I also, another part of what I'm doing is um, sun catchers, because as you can see, I live beneath a canopy of redwood trees, like hardly any sun ever gets mm-hmm. into this place. Like I'm, a, I'm less than a mile from the opening of the canyon, where is the Pacific Ocean? It's stunning. I'm, I can walk to the ocean. So when I like oh, drive awesome. from my house to the opening of the ocean, it's like my, my pupils just go, because <laughs> there's like, <laughs> I, I, I'm sun blind for like a minute until my eyes adjust. So the sun catchers were a way of me to, when the sun would like find little holes into my house, I could capture it and sprinkle the light around and be like, oh, there's some sun and it's sprinkled all around my house. And this is amazing. So I started making that. So everything is always born out of things that I just want for myself. So I wanted sun catchers. Oh, I'll make those mm-hmm. for other people. I want to make my own incense. Oh, I can make those for other people. You know, so it's, it's really about handcrafted, handmade, inspired items born out of my life and what in, what I need and what I think other people would like. But one of the most important things about Snow and Ink is its presentation. It's always beautifully presented. It's like when you receive a Snow and Ink package, it it's just a wonder, you know, to open up and unpackage. It's, it's amazing. So, And you can find it at snowandink.com. Yeah, it looks beautiful on your, on your website snowandink.com that's what i was going to say it's it's very beautiful on your website snowandink.com and it's, if it's ink like anyone out there listening, K, not like snow and ink like i n c it's like snow and pink yeah we'll, we'll yeah. make sure that we link out to it in 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 the podcast yeah. and but yeah if anyone listening is in need of like a, a housewarming gift or um, a little birthday gift or a, a holiday treat uh, snowandink.com and there's so many other they're, things they're that are going to be look- coming up in the next few weeks. Like it's one of those things where I create small batches of things and then they sell and then I create something else. So you have to keep coming back. Oh, that sounds awesome. I got really got into Palo Santo and candles and I even started making my own like room spray with essential oil. So I'm going to snow and ink nice. and I'm going <laughs> to buy some stuff. <laughs> Ingrid, I also wanted to mention that your debut album, May 19th, 1992, which is not available on streaming platforms as of yet, um, is available on your band camp page and it's a physical copy. Um, I, it's amazing. I'm actually going to buy one because I don't have a long box. Anymore. But <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. You, would you want to tell us a little bit about that? Because that's very unique. Well, um, 
at one point, you know, um, it wasn't reproduced anymore. So my manager at the time, mm-hmm. Paul Moe, contacted Warner Brothers and he's like, send me all of your promo stuff. So they send, you know, and the mm-hmm. promo box is going to have like a little, a, a, a notch in it, a nick in it, so that they're like, this isn't for retail. So all of them have the little, the nick in they them. They call them so you cutouts, know, remember? Yeah, little cutouts. Mm-hmm. You know, it's annoying, but whatever. Mm-hmm. So I just got boxes and boxes of them. And so, you know, I just keep them up for sale. Like, you know, but it is one of those things, like long boxes, like the dinosaur of CD, for, you know. Oh, that's mm-hmm. taking me back, taking me back to the Sam Goody Tower record days. Yeah. And the thing is, is that whenever we would get the CDs in the long box, we would throw the long box away. Now I'm like, I want my long box back, <laughs> you know, so. So yeah, I'll be buying May 19th, 1992, and I'm... It, I, do I even open it? I mean, I don't want to like break up the box. And like, <laughs> whenever people you have to listen me, to it. You have to. Yeah. Whenever people ask me if I, if I will sign it, I always like very like carefully like cut the bottom out and just like pull it out very delicate. <laughs> to sign it so that, you know, it's like they, they can pretend like it was never opened, but it was. So. Oh, that's yeah. so cool. Well, Ingrid, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. I, I know you're a busy lady and tell everyone where they can find you on social and, and online. Well, you can find me on Instagram, which is um, the place that I'm most active there and Twitter. Um, it's Ingrid Chavez Official. I think that's the both on Twitter and Instagram. I'm not on Facebook that much. I have I have issues with Facebook. Um, so yeah, good although, for you. Stay yeah, off it. Too. Stay off it. It's yeah. yeah. I do go up and you know like I'll put up stuff that's available just for that, but um, for social stuff, I'm I'm not on there. I I I'm really like I can't wait for that to be like put in check. Facebook. Mm-hmm. This month, it's 10 years that I've been off Facebook. I mean, not oh, bragging, wow. but, but I am bragging. Yeah. I, <laughs> congratulations. Like, it is like the demise of, <laughs> of, of civilization, I think. Western civilization. Um, yeah, yes. seriously. <laughs> yeah, so. All right, so yeah, you guys know where to find me. You can Ingrid. find me there. If you're on there, you can find me. Just look up Ingo Chavez. But there's IngoChavez.com. Mm-hmm. There's Snowing.com. There's, um, I'm on Bandcamp, and that's like, Bandcamp is like my favorite platform for um, selling music and um, yeah, merchandise. I love it. So yeah, that's, that's my favorite platform for that. So yeah. 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 And we'll make sure that we link out to all of that as well. So that way mm-hmm. everyone can find it. Speaking of, uh, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at MLVC podcast and on the web at MLVC podcast.com. And of course, we're streaming wherever you listen to your podcast. So mm-hmm. share us with your friends and your family and listen away and go visit Ingrid and see what she's offering up as well. And drop us a line. We love hearing from you. And yeah, and check out Graffiti Bridge because I don't feel like enough people have seen it. Ingrid, I want to thank you for sharing your beautiful energy with us today. And I look forward to like doing another deep dive into your music. And this has been really cool. Thank you for your time. Yes, thank Um, you for sharing that. And we are going to leave all of you with uh, Ingrid's very own version of Justify My Love. It is being released on December 18th, um, but we will close the show with it as well. So here's Justify My Love. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you.